I don't know. They act like it was a curse. They act like the people were a curse. And I don't think that anyone could ever make up for that gross mistreatment and misconduct. That's acting San Francisco police captain Yolanda Williams, a former member of the People's Temple, describing how survivors were shunned, humiliated, and then blamed when they returned from Jonestown. I'm Sheila McVicker, and in this epilogue to Oversight Jonestown, we're going to hear how the tragedy orchestrated by Jim Jones still haunts many more than 40 years after the massacre. Those who survived had their lives shattered and all faced betrayal. Betrayal by elected officials and bureaucrats from California to Washington, D.C., law enforcement, and even by their fellow Americans. The reaction when we returned to the States was, I remember, you know, on the plane and us flying over JFK and this enormous fear just engulfed me. And I thought, what am I going to do now? You know, what am I going, you know, what, what's going to happen to me? That's Leslie Wagner Wilson talking about her return to the United States. We listened to part of her story in episode one. Remember, she walked, yes, walked, 30 miles through the jungle with her three-year-old on her back to escape Jonestown on November 18, 1978, the day of the massacre. And the first thing that happened on her return, she was whisked away by the FBI. And then, of course, we were interrogated the entire night um, in an airport hangar. Survivors told us that at first, they were treated as criminals, then as pariahs. When we finally, you know, I saw the newspaper articles... Uh, That was disturbing. Um, But I felt stigmatized when we returned to the United States because after I saw the the articles, right, the news reports and the newspaper articles, they were really just reflecting these crazy people had went and followed this white man in the jungle and killed themselves and their children. So right away, I went underground, basically. Changed my name, never spoke about it. Even though Yolanda Williams left Jonestown a year before the massacre, she too hid her past. They act like it was a curse. They act like the people were a curse. The way way returning families were treated and people who lost their loved ones were treated was disrespectful. It was, and I don't think that anyone could ever make up for that gross mistreatment and misconduct. Acting Police Captain Yolanda Williams told us that it took a decade of being on the police force before she let any of her colleagues in on her past. There was a pervasive feeling that Jones's followers should have known better. The black community felt like we were fools to go following after a white man, and that's what they said. And those who did not make it back here got what they deserved. That not what was, they deserved. That, not what they deserved because they should never have followed the Antichrist because Jim Jones was known as the Antichrist. And um, that was a sentiment or the way for people, I guess, to not have to show their emotional uh, disappointment or have to show any signs of empathy to those who, for those who had come back. People's Temple members who escaped the suicidal carnage of Jonestown. The People's Temple cult of San Francisco and Jonestown, Guyana, the cult which killed itself. How do you begin to explain anything as macabre and bizarre as the weekend events surrounding the California religious cult known as the People's Temple in Guyana? What took hold in popular understanding at a time when even talking about suicide was very much a taboo was that this was an act of unspeakable evil, committed by crazed people, willing to die for a crazed leader, that everyone had lined up to freely drink the cyanide lace punch. What was lost was that many at the People's Temple, including the 304 children, had not chosen to die. They were murdered. In Guyana, The U.S. military descended to help bring home the remains of the 918 dead. 
The bodies were flown to Dover Air Force Base in Delaware to be identified. Families brought many home for burial. But hundreds could not be identified. Name tags fixed on the bodies in Guyana but written in erasable ink had been destroyed in tropical rain. Many had decomposed in the jungle heat and were beyond recognition. Entire families had perished, leaving no one to claim the bodies. Hundreds of the children had never been fingerprinted or even had a dental record. Much like the survivors, many of the unidentified dead were not wanted. This is NBC Nightly News. And in Delaware, there was outrage. The telephone calls began flooding radio station WKEN a week ago when the first victims of the Jonestown mass suicide were brought to the Dover Air Force Base. we got to get rid of these bodies. Mm. I know we can't have them laying around out there. Don't ship them to California. Don't ship them anywhere. Cremate the bodies. Mm-hmm. Let them keep them on that base until they can get a burial ground outside the state of Delaware. The state's governor met with the State Department to demand assurances that no unclaimed or unidentified bodies would be buried in any Delaware cemetery. Communities were repulsed by Jonestown and didn't want to become staging areas for remembrance. Guyana didn't want them. Now Delaware doesn't want them. And it appears the tragedy of Jonestown is still not over. For six months, the unclaimed dead languished in mortuaries in Delaware. California communities went to court to prevent burial in local cemeteries, saying they, quote, wanted no association with the atrocity. A cemetery wall was sprayed with graffiti, reading, no way, no Jonestown. And no cemetery in San Francisco, which for many had been their home, would agree to take the remains. I'm on a breezy hillside in Oakland, across the bay from San Francisco. I met the Evergreen Cemetery. And at this cemetery is the memorial to the victims of Jonestown. When the bodies of all those who died were brought back to the US, there were some people who had no family left and no one to claim the body. There were other families that didn't want anything to do with the tragedy. And so those remains went unclaimed. And Evergreen was the only burial ground in the United States that would take the unclaimed remains and give them a resting place. Those bodies have no business being in Oakland. They're supposed to be here in San Francisco. They're supposed to be in Colma. That's where they're supposed to be. And But not one gravesite would take those bodies. Here's Marshall Kilduff the journalist who wrote the explosive expose on Jim Jones in California. He's now an op-ed writer for the San Francisco Chronicle. San Francisco has never built a memorial to the victims. There was a lot of worry. Also, the city never really memorialized uh, the Jonestown event. I mean, how do you memorialize something that happened so far away and all that? But these were people who, in some cases, originated in San Francisco. There's never been a statue. There's never been a, you know, a any kind of marker. Uh, Why do you think that is? Well, we don't always memorialize awful events. We like to, we like to put up uh, generals on horseback. Uh, This is certainly not a case for that. And I think there's a bit of shame. Uh, The same public officials (laughs) who tolerated Jones would have been cutting the ribbon at this, this so-called memorial idea. So the only memorial to the dead is in that out-of-the-way corner of Evergreen Cemetery in the Oakland Hills, where 412 are buried. There are four gray slabs etched with all 918 names. Patricia Parks, James Warren Jones, that's Reverend Jim Jones, and John Victor Stone. John Victor, who we told you about in Episode 4, was a six-year-old boy who had been at the center of the custody battle that Jones was willing to destroy the people's temple over. Like so many, John Victor's body could not be identified. His mother, Grace Stone, who had once been part of Jones's inner circle, but who had fled the people's temple before the move to Guyana, lives in California. The death of John Victor, the child she could not get back from Jim Jones, still haunts her. More than 40 years later, talking about the boy he was, is too painful. 
I don't, I don't know if I could bring that up. <laughs> I'm not in a good place. Gray Stone says Americans don't understand what really happened. Most people um, believe that uh, People's Temple was a mass um, suicide when in fact it was a mass murder because what the people had endured for the years that they endured and the brainwashing and they were tired and they were hungry and uh, isolated, very isolated. Um, it, it's uh, it, 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 it's not right. It, 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 it was a mass murder. I'm sure some people wanted to die, but I'm sure, and especially the children, I know they didn't want to die. There are other children we need to talk about. Children who were stolen. Yes, stolen. Children who disappeared. We know that in California, as a regular practice, the People's Temple took children from their parents and put them into other homes. That was how John Victor Stone was taken from his mother, Grace. And we know that the People's Temple kept on file documents, powers of attorney, and permission to travel documents that had the effect of giving anyone, related or not, permission to take any People's Temple child to Guyana. The People's Temple in California also ran foster homes for children, and People's Temple members also became court-appointed guardians. More than half of the children in Jonestown had traveled there without a parent, other relative, or guardian. Here's Yolanda Williams. There were children that were taken to Jonestown illegally. How were they taken to Jonestown? They were, passports were gotten for them. In the aftermath of Jonestown, there is a moment when people begin to ask questions and rummage around in files. In our last episode, we told you about the limited investigations that took place after Jonestown and how there was almost no culpability for those who enabled Jones and his crimes. There was one other investigation that we found. This one by the Government Accountability Office of the GAO, which is charged with looking at how taxpayer dollars are spent. This investigation, two years after the tragedy, primarily examined if government funds were paid out on foster children or state wards after they had been stolen from California by the People's Temple and moved to Guyana. This GAO report treated the impact on human lives, on children, primarily as an accounting matter. But we reviewed the report and considered the human cost. The GAO report found that 19 children, 19 wards of the court, were taken illegally from California to Jonestown. And at least one foster child was taken illegally from California to Jonestown. All of them were murdered. So in the case of the children, Mm -hmm. Has there ever been any kind of reckoning about those children? Not to my knowledge. Um, there's never really been any talk in San Francisco, to my knowledge, about the missing children or concern about some children that have never been accounted for. What about the families? Parents might not have survived or the parents might not have known what to do or just given up because they had no legal system to back them or support them. I don't think that the government's going to help you figure out how to sue them. Money had always been a big part of the People's Temple Jonestown equation. In our first episode, we described what happened the day of the massacre. And here's what we told you. One of Jones's lieutenants summons a man named Tim Carter. We've spoken to Carter several times, and this is what he told us. He, along with two others, were summoned to the command hut. And there, they were given three suitcases full of cash and gold, nearly a million U.S. dollars in cash, and told by any means to get it to the Soviet embassy in Georgetown, along with documents that sign over even more millions of the People's Temple money to the USSR. In the end, Tim Carter and the others were arrested by Guyanese police. They never got to the Soviet embassy. He eventually returned to the U.S. We're back with Yolanda Williams, a former member of the People's Temple leadership, 
talking about Jim Jones. Did you think he had a lot of money? Oh, I knew he had a lot of money. I was a member of the planning commission. I already had Swiss bank accounts and everything. He was filtering money all over the place because he said they'd never capture him alive. He'd always have some place to go. And where did Jones get his money? Here's what we told you in episode two. Other than the property that he had people sign over, other than the social security checks, the foster children checks, the pension checks. Insurance policies, jewelry, and uh, any type of stocks and bonds or or things that you may have uh, accumulated or acquired. And if you knew that your parent was dying or had a trust for you, try and make a deal with them prior to their deaths to try and get some early payout money. Here's Leslie Wagner Wilson. What is rarely mentioned ever is that the majority of the people in People's Temple were African-American. And the black women, and my mother included, because she owned a business and a house, the majority of monies that came through were from black folks. So we're the majority there, right? We're the ones that are contributing the most. And so Jonestown and People's Temple was really built off the backs of, of African Americans. It just was. It just was. And so that's never really spoken about, you know. The FBI and the court appointed receiver did track down the cash, at least some of it, from bank accounts in Panama, throughout the Caribbean, and Switzerland. There were safety deposit boxes, gold Krugerrands, jewelry, multiple shell corporations, numbered bank accounts, accounts in the names of individuals, including several in the name of a 70-year-old woman, Annie Jean McGowan, that totaled more than $7 million. In all, it added up to about $10 million. In today's terms, that's $40 million. So what happened to the money? The U.S. government took $1.6 million for bringing the bodies home. The Guyanese government sued for damages and got another million. The cemetery in Oakland was paid. Former members sued to get back property they had given to the People's Temple. And others wanted settlements for those who had died. Most people, I think they were paid $1,000 or $2,000 for family members that they lost, which is nothing, a penny, because there were millions upon millions upon millions of dollars that they had stashed all over the place. But no one ever contacted us to ask us if we wanted to file a claim or anything. It's just like we didn't even exist. The Ryan sisters, Erin and Patricia, said they felt betrayed by their country over and over particularly painful and poignant since they, like their father, the assassinated Congressman Leo Ryan, devoted their lives to public service and the government. Everything became a battle, even getting a posthumous congressional gold medal for their father, one of the few congressmen to have been assassinated in the line of duty. Why would that not just be automatic, that we have to that's honor we, this person? That's what we, we wanted to know. Understand. We had to walk the halls and, so, and go to every office and get signatures and persuade them to to sign on. And it, it, it was... Did people say no? Yeah. Yeah. Awarding a Congressional Gold Medal requires 218 signatures. In the end... It took five years before President Reagan signed a bill authorizing it. Is it just a question of changing time, or is there something is there something around that story of what happened to your dad? We don't know. We don't know. But we spent months. So what happened to some of the other people who told us their stories? No one came out unscathed. State Department officials, including the Ambassador John Burke and the desk officer Frank Tuminia, saw their promising careers stall. Another State Department official, who spoke to us on background, told us he suffered a breakdown. David Rubin, the investigator we featured in Episode 3 from the San Francisco District Attorney's Office, lost his job and his marriage. And when you talk to the survivors, most openly talk about post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Here's Leslie Wagner-Wilson again. Her story is like so many others. 
I suffer from PTSD, but it wasn't diagnosed. I had survivor's guilt, it wasn't diagnosed. So I probably spent the first 20 years functioning, you know, um, externally, but internally I, I just, I suffered. I suffered tremendously. She repeated some of the mistakes and horrors of her past. My first relationship out of Jonestown was an abusive relationship. And then I realized that, you know, I would get beat and then it would be okay. And then I think about the good times and then I'd say, well, I love him and he loves me. He's just angry. What can I do? I guess I have to do this better. And then it stuck to me. We were in this enormous, this huge abusive relationship with Jim Jones. And so he would, he would, he would show love and then he'd show, you know, this demonic side of him, this, you know, sadistic side of him. And then he'd say, oh, then you show the love again. So it was back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And then I understood how people, my mom included, could stay, you know, to stay. It took me a couple of years to get out of that relationship. I was very self-destructive. I did not want to be here. Um, I had tried suicide once. And the only reason I didn't pull the trigger was because I thought of Jakari. And it was on, it was on the, the first Mother's Day. Jakari is the youngest survivor of Jonestown and Leslie Wagner Wilson's son. And I was so lost and damaged and, and I just didn't want to survive. It took decades, but Leslie Wagner Wilson put together the shattered pieces of her life, survived, and told us she's now thriving. What is rarely mentioned is the continuing impact of Jonestown on the children, Yolanda Williams. And needless to say, a few of the returning youth that were babies or or children over in uh, Jonestown, unfortunately, engaged in criminal misconduct. That's what happened to Jakari. Leslie Wagner Wilson told us that the three-year-old son she carried on her back has never been able to shake off the trauma of Jonestown. And she is convinced what happened shaped the course of his life. So he has a, he has a long prison sentence. I think he'll be out in five years due to his age. But the majority of his life has been, sent in, has been spent in prison. And that's because of um, the emotional distress. We have spent months with this story, and we've thought a lot about the People's Temple, about Jim Jones, about Jonestown. And we have thought about those who were drawn to the Temple and to Jones. There was certainly a time when the end was not inevitable, when Jim Jones and the People's Temple did represent what many members sought, a more equitable and just way of life, a community that was more caring. That was real. It was also corrupted and ultimately destroyed. It doesn't matter if it was mental illness or drug use or megalomania or delusion or all of the above. In the end, what Jim Jones built was a criminal enterprise masquerading as a church. It was a betrayal of everything the Reverend Jones said he stood for and the complete betrayal of everyone who had followed him. Thank you for listening to Oversight. We appreciate the feedback you provided in comments, ratings, and reviews, and want to keep hearing from you. What scandal in American history do you want us to take another look at through the lens of congressional oversight? Please email us at oversight at cqrollcall.com. We look forward to bringing you Season 2 of Oversight. Oversight Jonestown was reported and written by me and Joanne Levine. These episodes were produced by Evan Campbell with an assist from Micaela Rodriguez. Sound design throughout, also by Evan Campbell. Editing by Martha Ann Overland. Fact-checking by Noah Berman. Oversight Jonestown could not have happened without the reporting help and insights of our CQ colleagues, Mark Strickerts and Marsha Myers. A huge shout-out to Jillian Roberts for her tireless support. 
Joanne Levine is executive producer. Special thanks also goes to Fielding Mac McGee of the Jonestown Institute, who has devoted decades to gathering oral histories, conducting original research, and forcing the U.S. government to release tens of thousands of classified documents. We've read many of them. He also answered every call, text, and email with humor and grace. Tim Reederman's authoritative book, Raven, was a central reading and reference. Other source material, thousands of pages of documents, including but not limited to declassified State Department cables, FBI documents, CIA documents, and congressional reports. We're grateful to everyone who took the time to speak with us on the record and on background. If you visit our website at rollcall.com forward slash Jonestown, you'll see a beautiful design by Marnie Prince. It was built by Patrick Blinkhorn, Rajiv Manath, and Tom Schaefer. Oversight is a production of CQ Roll Call.